There have been several times in the past when I visited a Janutai in Thailand, and there have been other Westerners there. And he's asked me to translate for him. He wants to give them the basic message of the Buddhist teachings. And the point that he keeps returning to again and again is the teaching on rebirth. His feeling was that given the small amount of time he had to talk to that person, he wanted to make sure that the important message got through. Because what does rebirth teach? It teaches that we have to take the long view. And the long view is not just a month or a year or to the end of this life. As a John Lee would say, our story is not a short story, it's a long story. It goes for many, many lifetimes. And if we don't take the long view, we can cause ourselves a lot of trouble in the long term. This may be one of the things that John Ratai has seen in Thailand as well. In the modern world, people tend to think in very short terms. There's that great New Yorker cartoon where a group of executives are sitting around a table. And the chief is saying, well, we met our quarterly targets, but we lost our immortal souls. Now, in Buddhism, we don't talk about immortal souls, but we do talk about the fact that rebirth happens. It's a process. And the Buddha didn't simply pick up this idea from his society unthinkingly. After all, it was a hot topic. Some people taught rebirth, other people taught that there was no rebirth. And even those that taught rebirth disagreed as to whether karma had any effect on it. And so he was very much taking a position on what he thought was an important topic. Because we have to think about the things we do in order to get what we want, and the things that we can gain in the human realm often require that we do unskillful things. We see something, and if there's no sense of right and wrong, then it's going to require some harmful actions. And it's very easy for people to do the harmful action. They say, well, it doesn't matter. I get what I want. But then when you take the long term, you realize the things that you can get that way are not worth it. You hold them for a little while, and then they're gone. In the meantime, you've burdened yourself with bad karma. You develop bad habits of the mind. When the Buddha talks about the treasures that we can develop in the mind, things like conviction, virtue, shame, compunction, learning, generosity, discernment. We can also develop their opposites. So the question is, which one do you want to take with you? Because these are the things that you can take with you. The things of the world cannot be taken. The position you've gained in the world, the power you've gained in the world. even the wrongs that you've righted in the world, but have done in an unskillful way. Those you can't take. And in John Lee's image, when death comes, it's like we're forced to immigrate. We have to immigrate to another country without any warning, and we just go without our baggage. We can't take anything along with us. We have only what we've got in our pockets. So the qualities you develop in your mind, those are the things that are in your pockets. Everything else gets left behind. So it's especially important when there's a lot of social unrest, or there's a lot of misery around the quarantine, That even in extreme situations like this, we have to make sure that we maintain our virtue, we maintain our good qualities. Because these times will pass, 
And we may survive them, and we may not, may, may not, at least the body may not, but the mind will survive. So the processes of the mind will survive. Then they survive best when we've worked on the good qualities inside. So as we live with one another, we should try to take it as an opportunity not to get back at one another or to express our frustration, take out our frustration on one another. Our relations are opportunities for developing the perfections, for developing what the Buddha called noble treasures. When you can think in those terms, you're thinking in the long term, you're taking the long view. The same thought applies to your meditation. When the Buddha talks about rebirth, what distinguishes his teaching from everybody else in his time was he never tried to define what it was that took rebirth. That was how people decided whether rebirth happened or not. They said, you are X, and either X or something that was going to die with the body, or else it might not die with the body. So they reason things out. But the Buddha never tried to define what you are. After all, it would be something for which you are not responsible, if this is what you already were made of. And you just willy-nilly would get reborn and not get reborn. But he taught that it's a choice that you make, and it's a process, a series of processes. And the big ones are craving and clinging. And if you can't get any control over your craving and clinging, then rebirth is going to be very difficult. It could lead you in all kinds of ways. Because at the moment of death, when the body is weak, the mind is frustrated, the mind is distraught. Cravings and clingings can bubble up inside. We latch on and we go. And when the mind is distraught like that, it tends not to be very choosy. It just takes whatever comes. And who knows what's going to come bubbling up out of your karmic past. So we meditate to get some control over our cravings and clingings. Every time the thought comes up that you could go away from the breath, you've got to realize, okay, this is exactly how rebirth happens. And if I'm not good at sticking with what I know is right, then who knows what side paths the mind will take. So try to be really on top of yourself, watching yourself carefully. One of the strange tendencies there is in modern Dharma is to tell people, well, don't try too hard, don't place too many demands on yourself, don't make yourself miserable by, over the fact that the mind is not centered and the mind's not settling down. Don't even try. Just let it happen naturally. But death doesn't say that. That says you're going to make your choices right now. And it's not there with a soothing voice, sympathetic for your neuroses. So you've got to learn how to take yourself in hand. And on the one hand, be encouraging that yes, you can do this. And see, Little victories as what as just that, as victories. And not as something to deprecate. But you want to have a string of them so they get bigger and bigger. So you find it easier and easier to say no to a distraction. Or you can find it easier that once you've realized the mind has been wandering off, that you can pull the mind right back and get back to where you were. Because these are skills you're going to really need. 
and it's not an act of self-compassion to say, well, it doesn't matter. It does matter. What you do with your mind right now is really important. And see that not as a burden, but see it as an opportunity. So when you take the long view, you realize the things that are happening out there right now are not nearly as important as what's happening right here, as the mind is making choices. So paradoxically, by taking the long view, the focus gets focused right back here, right now. But then again, that's how the Buddha gained his awakening. He took the very long view he saw the cycles of rebirth that beings can go through. And his immediate reaction was to turn around and look at the mind right here in the present moment, realizing that this is what needs to be straightened out. Once you straighten this out, then the long term is taken care of. So again, see this as an opportunity. You have a sense of the power that you have to make a difference. The story of the world right now. If you believe the media, it's everything else is happening. There's where the power is. The people who seize the power. Those are the important ones. But from the long view, those are the ones who are going to suffer the most. So use the power you have right now. to make the wise choices, because it is within your power to really make a difference, a difference that will last for the long term. <laughs>